Uh, today's presentation, we called it Saving Your Retirement, Dangers That Can Drain Your Investment Account. Really, really it's a big introduction to our investment philosophy as a team, uh, the common issues that we see when we meet new people. And uh, we're not going to give you just the problems. We're also going to give you some of the solutions to handle those issues. So before I dive into the content, I'll take a second to introduce myself and my co-presenter. My name is Jordan. I'm coming to you from Calgary, Alberta. So it's a morning presentation for me. And I'm joined by Matt, and he is in Montreal. So we're coming across the country. We're presenting across the country. Uh, if someone thinks they're farther west than me, feel free to throw it in the chat. I'm curious where we have people across the country. Uh, so today's presentation, we're going to be diving into some stuff. And embarrassingly enough, uh, I started doing this in 2015. And it probably took me about five years for this content to really click in my head. As soon as it did, I made big changes to how I work with clients, big changes to how I uh, manage, manage working with teams. And uh, hopefully, we can get you caught up what took me five years, we can get it done for you in 40 minutes. So for today's presentation, we're not using PowerPoint. We're using an interactive software called Mentimeter. So as we go through this, you're going to see different slides pop up. And you're actually able to interact with those slides. You're going to be able to uh, vote, rank things, give feedback, and that will help Matt and I decide what direction we take things. As well as we're going through things, if there's any questions, if we're not explaining things well, feel free to throw it in the chat. We'll answer it as we can. And we have the talented Ben Wilson in the chat. He's not on video, but he'll be there. Uh, he can send links and supporting articles as we go through content. But for now, either open a separate window and go to menti.com and type in the code that you see on the screen. Or you can use your cell phone. You can scan the QR code that you see on the screen. And what's gonna happen is in that window, it's gonna show you slides that you can interact with and you can vote, you can give feedback, that sort of thing. Uh, you can do it with one hand if you're eating your lunch. And so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get started with our first question. So on our system here, let's not hop over to Google and try to figure this out. But what do you think the best performing stock market was in 2022. Uh, if you missed the instructions, you can see them down on the bottom left or at the top. Well, let's take a guess. Uh, overall, the markets were down in 2022. So if you look at the entire globe, it was down. But of that, were there any positive stories? Did anyone, did any country do well and have outsized uh, returns? We can see there's a lot of clustering around Brazil, Canada. It's easy to track the Canadian stock market. We live here. Uh, we see it in the headlines every day. I'll give it another maybe 20 seconds just to see if everyone's able to log in and start voting. But uh, yeah, so we have USA and Canada. We see them in the headlines all the time. So they're usually top of mind. Most people I talk to aren't tracking the Brazilian stock market, the Portuguese, or the Turkish. And so the correct answer is Turkey. So if you look at the returns of all uh, a bunch of different countries around the globe, um, on average, everything was down, but Turkey actually crushed it. They were up 120% last year. I didn't talk to anyone in 2021 who said, hey, man, you've got to get into Turkish equities. That's where the gains are going to be. And so this is jumping forward a little bit, but this really highlights what we call global diversification. So you have no idea what countries are going to do well next year. We all have a tendency to be kind of biased towards Canada. We're proud of where we live. But what we can see is that if you didn't hold any Turkish equities, you missed the best performing market in the world last year. I have no idea what's going to be next year. But uh, yeah, this is just to highlight that A, the software is working, everyone's able to vote. And then B, opportunity strikes where you least expect it. I didn't expect Turkey to do this, but they had a great return last year. So for today's content, we said we're going over dangers that can affect your investment accounts. Uh, we're going to step back first and say, why do we have to invest at all? Why do we have to expose ourselves to these dangers? Why can't I just buy high interest savings, cruise, not look at the headlines and just relax? Once we define why we need to invest, we're going to hop into the best tools we've found in order to generate a return, in order to help secure your long-term goals in your retirement. And then finally, we'll touch on implementation. As we're going through it, like I said before, feel free to interact, vote with the slides. But if you have questions, throw them in the chat. We'll answer them in line. And we have like 20 minutes earmarked at the end as well for open Q&A. But for now, let's take a step back and start talking about why do we even need to invest in the first place? All right, so we're going to kick this section off with another mentee question for everyone. 
Um, if something costs a thousand dollars today, how much do you think it cost thirty years ago? Let everyone put in some guesses. All right. Guess is all over the map here. Really all over the map here. It's great. Awesome. Okay. So the correct answer, and we're seeing some clustering near there, was around $550. So you, if, if something was $550 30 years ago, you need $1,000 to buy it now. And uh, that's due to inflation. Uh, inflation during the last 30 years was actually a little lower than the historical average. It was only around 2%, which is way lower than what we've seen in recent years. And uh, we don't know what future inflation will be. If inflation during that same period of time was closer to 4%, you would need $1,700 roughly to afford the same $550 item 30 years ago. And here's the thing about inflation. Inflation is not necessarily all bad. It's not, yeah, it's not necessarily all bad. Inflation in a way can drive um, innovation. If, you, um, if, if you're a business and you've got a ton of money sitting in a bank account and you know that it'll be worth less 10 years from now, why would you let it sit in the bank account? Why would you let, like, let it erode away? Um, you're gonna reinvest in your business. You're gonna try to create new products. Uh, if you're Apple, you know, you're going to try to improve the iPhone that you've made. And as a consumer, knowing that your money is worth less than 10 years and seeing that there's a brand new iPhone out, even though that yours is probably perfectly fine, you might be tempted to go and spend money and buy that new iPhone. Uh, inflation can also erode debt. So if 30 years ago you had, say, $100,000 of debt, and in 30 years, so today, um, your compensation, your salary increased significantly. Um, the cost of goods increased significantly. That $100,000 of debt doesn't seem as, uh, as intimidating per se. And governments love this because governments fund a lot of their projects with debt. And how are you going to repay that debt as the government? Are you going to raise taxes? No one likes paying more in taxes. Uh, you can let inflation slowly erode at the debt that they've taken on. But one of the problems or one of the dangers uh, for your retirement account or for your retirement in general is that as things cost more, uh, there's a chance that you did not save enough money or your uh, savings did not keep up with the cost of goods. And a lot of people think that as you're investing, uh, the big danger is uh, the fluctuations, right? So the market crashes, the volatility, uh, and that's fair, that's true. But really a significant danger is that inflation outpaces what you saved and that affects your lifestyle and retirement. So on that topic, we know that we need to keep up with inflation now because that's how we're going to be able to have uh, a decent retirement. Uh, we've got some tools up on the screen here, and I'm going to ask everyone to rank which tools they think is best to worst uh, to keep up with inflation over that period of time. Votes for gold, crypto. There you go. Bonds, high interest savings. Interesting. Very cool. More votes for crypto. Pierre Poliev in the chat. And just a heads up, if people joined us a little bit late, uh, you can log in at the URL at the top of the screen there, and you can interact with the slides as well. So open up a different browser window, go to menti.com, type in the code, and you can join in on the uh, exciting action of ranking these inflation. Thanks for the hedges. Awesome. Yeah. So. Like in the rankings here, uh, we're gonna start with high interest savings. High interest savings um, obviously have increased, like the rate you can get in your account has increased significantly uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, it's not uncommon to find you know, rates of 5%, GIC is upwards of 5%. But here's the kicker, inflation's been like seven or 8% and is only now starting to come down. So it, we've seen re in recent years and historically, it hasn't done a really good job of keeping up with inflation. Uh, gold, uh, has been good over long durations of time. So we're talking hundreds of years, uh, but not as consistent over shorter durations of time, like 20, 30, even 40 years. So if you are managing you know, your money or managing money for an institution, and you're gonna have expenses for like an undefined amount of time, 
for a really long time, you might consider it. But you aren't likely to live to 100 years. Um, so there are probably some better options for you out there. Uh, crypto, very new, very speculative. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it in recent years. And then it all died down because, hey, inflation has been really high in the past few years. And crypto has gone down you know, 70 to 90, 95%, depending on the currency. So uh, we'll probably skip over that today. But we're going to spend a lot of time talking about stocks and bonds. Um, when clients, um, when people reach out in general, this is um, what we recommend. And this is what we'll be spending more time on today. Yeah, so we throw around the term stocks and bonds quite often talking to each other. But just before we dive into the, the details on it, I want to take a step back and understand what these two things are and how they can help us out. So if we look from the perspective of a company as a business, say we're Apple, we want to engage in projects that increase the value of our company and that takes cash. So Apple's a bad example, they have tons of cash, but let's say you're like a small business uh, getting, you don't have very much cash on hand. You're gonna say, I need to get money from somewhere. Should I borrow it? Or should I sell a portion of my business to raise cash? So I could say, hey, I'm gonna issue a bond, uh, that's borrowing money. So I'm going to, someone's going to give me a thousand dollars. I promise to pay them $50 a year for the next five years. And then I give them their thousand dollars back. There's a promise in place. So it feels like a safe investment to them. And I'm obligated to make those payments each year. Otherwise I'm defaulting <clears throat> on my debt as a business. That's what a bond is. The only reason why I would borrow money at that rate is because I thought I could grow my company faster than what I'm borrowing it for. I would never borrow money at 5% to grow my business at 4%. That'd be dumb. I might as well just not borrow the money in the first place. And so we expect stocks, the value of a company to go up faster than the rate that's paid on bonds. A, because that's what they're borrowing money for in the first place. And B, because the stocks are riskier. So if the company fails, the bondholders get paid first and the stockholders get paid second. And so we see when it comes to investing, you can choose, do I want to be a owner of the business? Or do I want to be a loaner to the business? Being a loaner, I have a lower expected return, but that return is contract contractually obligated to be made to me over time. So it's a lot more reliable. As an owner, I'm banking on their projects being more successful than the debt that they take on, but it's not guaranteed to happen. I could go long periods of time where there's underperformance and eventually get paid out, or it might not ever work out at all. And so in building portfolios and investing, we like to use these two assets together. The job of stocks is to generate a return. The job of bonds is to make the portfolio not jump around as much such that we don't get uncomfortable. We don't sell early. Uh, it's more for emotional behavior management and to provide some cash flow in the short term. So very often people will say, I don't want to invest in bonds. Bonds are terrible. They have a terrible return. But that's looking at them through the lens of bonds are supposed to generate a return which they're not. They're supposed to reduce volatility and generate the best return that they can. But the returns primarily come from the stocks that you hold. So someone who's done saving their whole life, they've been building a nest egg for many years and re they're retired, they might say, I don't want that much risk. I'm going to do like half stocks, half bonds. It's a nice balanced portfolio for me. But younger people who are saving lots, putting money away, they care less about things bouncing around. Higher allocation of stocks in their investment portfolio. And so I mentioned that stocks, the goal of stocks is to generate a return. A question for the group here, how much do you think stocks outperformed inflation over the last roughly 50 years uh, on average per year? So it's not like clockwork every year you're guaranteed to outperform inflation. What do you think the average spread between inflation was and the returns of the stock market? Give everyone a chance to get their votes in here. Give another few seconds for people to vote. All right. So if you said 6%, that would be correct. So global stocks, all the stocks in the world have uh, together uh, beat inflation by an average of 6% per year for the last 50 years or so. And 6% might not sound like much. Um, but here's the thing. If you're looking at this chart here, it's very easy to see that even though the cost of goods since 1970 has gone up seven times, 
the global stock market has uh, blown that out of like blown it out of the water completely. Um, which is interesting to think about. And when Jordan and I are talking about this, we're not talking about uh, a stock. We're not talking about an individual stock. We're talking about the global stock market in general. Uh, usually when people come and ask us for a second opinion or they're looking to get started, uh, usually the question we'll get is, uh, what stock should I buy? What company should I buy? What do you think about this company? And uh, it's not always that clear cut to pick a stock. And to help it illustrate why it's not quite simple, uh, we're gonna run through this quick example with you. So let's say there's hundred people in a room. Uh, hundred people, uh, you're at a party, there's a bunch of people in there and the average uh, net worth in that room is $2 billion. As you're walking around that room, how hard do you think it would be to uh, meet a billionaire? And you might, not, you might be thinking, okay, well, probably not that hard. I'll go up to someone and to chat with them and to find out, okay, well, they only have a measly $500 million net worth, but the next person's probably a billionaire. Well, what if Elon Musk was in that room? So if you had 100 people in that room, but Elon was in there, and Elon with his over $200 billion net worth um, was, in fact, the only billionaire in that room. Uh, if, unless you spoke to Elon, you would not have found a billionaire. Um, and that's a concept of skewness, Elon skewing the average net worth in that room. And uh, stocks in general are very similar. Because if you're picking stocks, uh, <laughs> most of them actually end up going to zero over time. Most of them end up losing a ton of value. Most of them are losers. Um, but we saw a couple of slides ago that the global stocks in general um, outpace inflation significantly. Uh, so instead of looking for the needle in the haystack, instead of looking for, say, the next Tesla, the next Apple, the next Shopify, uh, and probably being wrong, instead of looking for the needle in the haystack, why not just buy the whole haystack um, and avoid that completely? And, you know, as we're talking about this, uh, you've probably come across people or experts on TV or, or YouTube um, telling you that, no, you can't pick stocks. There's a proven way. I've figured out how to do it. Um, so why are we still talking about this? And one of the reasons we're still talking about this is availability bias. Uh, we uh, will hear people talk about their winners. Uh, we don't often hear people talk about their losers. Uh, we don't hear about all the ones that did not succeed. We hear about the ones that did, and they usually will share their best examples. Um, and here's the thing, like these people sound smart. They sound like they know what they're talking about. Um, they'll throw out big words like cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratios, and uh, they'll sound really convincing. So how could it be that, you know, they still aren't succeeding significantly when they're smart? And uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, if anyone's ever heard of it, plays a role here. So as you begin to learn uh, about a topic, your confidence in what you know uh, tends to be pretty high. You tend to know enough to be dangerous, right? So uh, you might think, okay, well, I've got a good grasp of this stuff now. I can go and do it. It's uh, it's great. I'm just going to throw myself out there. I'm going to start sharing a. I'm going to start selling a course on how to pick stocks. Uh, but really, over time, <laughs> you come to realize, oh shoot, there's a lot I didn't know. There's a lot I don't know. Um, and man, like we've had uh, the privilege to interview Nobel Prize winners on our podcast. Uh, and these people are practically the fathers of modern finance, uh, undoubtedly experts in the field, and they don't pick stocks. They understand that it's a losing proposition and uh, that it really isn't consistent enough to do. Um, you're better off just buying the whole pay stack. And their philosophy is the philosophy that we share out of firm at Peter Bale as well. Perfect. So, so to recap where we've been so far, <clears throat> investing for most people, it's not optional. Unless you have a ton of money or a very, very low spending rate, you're probably going to need to harness the power of the markets to outpace inflation over time. The best tool that we have to outpace inflation is investing in stocks, but it's not individual stocks. It's the stock market as a whole, because we don't know where the needle in the haystack is. We don't know that we're going to find Elon if we're talking to people at random. 
We want to have the whole amount, the whole thing in aggregate. We know that we have all the losers if we do that. We also know that we have the winners, the ones who drive the massive returns in excess of inflation that can keep up our purchasing power or even increase our purchasing power as we go through retirement. And so rather than, so if you say, hey, like Matt and Jordan, these guys sound pretty smart. I'm going to follow their advice. I'm not going to pick individual stocks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a basket of stocks. Let's say uh, you want to invest in the U.S. And the most popular uh, benchmark in the U.S. is the top 500 companies approximately. So let's say you said, yeah, I'm not going to pick individual companies. I'm not going to bank on Tesla. I'm not going to bank on uh, Berkshire Hathaway. What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy one share of every company in the S&P 500, one share of every company uh, that makes up the top 500 companies in the States. How much cash do you think you would need to save up before you were able to invest, before you were able to buy one share of each company in the index? Yeah, so you think you're sitting on cash? You think you're sitting on, or are you sitting on, you'd wait to have 10 grand, 20 grand. When would you have enough cash built up that you could invest and not be concentrated in one single company? Because we saw on a previous slide, if you invest in any random company, the most likely outcome is that your stock goes to zero over 10 years. So we don't want to be buying single companies uh, all at once. We want to wait until we have enough money to be what's called diversified. Diversification is spreading out your risk over multiple companies. I'll give us another 10 seconds here before we dive into it. I promise you that the answer is on this line. I can see in the chat, someone said 250K. I'm not tricking everybody. <laughs> Putting an answer that is outside of the line. Oh, and another note too. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, this is for the nerds. Berkshire Hathaway is in the S&P 500. I'm talking about their B shares. They have A shares, which are prohibitively expensive. Uh, we're talking about B shares today, which are a little bit more accessible to guys like us. Perfect. So the correct answer is $90,000 as of the time that I did this last week. So if you want to be diversified in just the States, in just the United States, you need to save up $90,000, then invest it. And then you wouldn't have any Canada. You wouldn't have any Turkey. You wouldn't have anything overseas. You would have just your U.S. allocation and you wouldn't even have the small companies in the States. So you're waiting until you accumulate a large amount of money, then allocating it and then waiting again. And so this isn't realistic, but what if instead of having $90,000, you got together with 90 friends and each of you invested $1,000 or you got together with 90,000 friends and each of you invested $1. This is really how a fund works. So rather than picking individual stocks and rather than trying to buy all the stocks ourselves, what we use with most clients and what we recommend to most people is you use a fund structure instead. So a fund it's just a basket of different stocks and bonds mixed together. You can have a Canadian fund, you can have a global fund, you can have a uh, electric vehicle fund that only invests in electric vehicles. It's a basket that has a common theme throughout its holdings. I'll often meet people and they'll say, I don't feel very diversified. I look at my bank statement and all I see is the TD Global Growth Fund. That's one holding. I feel like I'm really like at a lot of risk. But what they don't realize is that within that one line, inside that account, there are, there are uh, thousands of different stocks inside there. And Dimitri, I can see yeah, Berkshire A costs half a million. So that's why I said Berkshire B for the yeah. last slide. Yeah, no, no one, none of us are buying Berkshire A. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so there's this basket of stocks all mixed together. And so rather than you saying, okay, I have to save up 90 grand just to do my US investments, what you're able to do is take a small amount of money and get full diversification by buying a little bit of a fund instead. And so when we work with people, when we're talking to clients and uh, families that we're meeting with, very often we'll say like, you don't have $500 million in order to spread it out and buy all the stocks yourself. Let's use the fund structure to get you to buy the entire haystack to make sure that you don't miss the stocks that drive all the returns in excess of, in excess of inflation. Uh, but unfortunately it's easier said than done. So just like there's more recipes than there are foods, there's more funds than there are stocks in the world because a fund is going to be a mixture of all the different stocks together. And so when I say, hey, you should use a fund and not individual stocks, that has increased the number of choices that you have, not decreased it. You're going to be inherently spread out, you're spreading out your risk because you're holding funds, not stocks, but it's so hard to choose because if you look at any company, they're going to have hundreds of different options. How do you compare them? How do you figure out 
what's the best one for me and my goals. Second to that is that the average investor does way worse than the funds that they invest in. There's a Dalbar study that comes out each year where they look at the average return of investments versus the people that use those investments. And there's this huge gap. And so we call this the behavior gap. How is it possible that I'm buying something and I'm getting worse returns than what the thing generates itself? It must be my behavior. Because if I just owned it all the time, I would get those returns. So I said that uh, when it comes to picking funds, there's more funds than there are stocks. But what do you think the best tools are in order to pick a fund? There's a whole forest of them out there, a whole noise of like, there's hundreds of Canadian funds, hundreds of US. How do you cut through the noise and find the funds that are going to be the right for you and have the best returns? Yeah, so easy fees at the top of the list there, but then we can see some other things too around star rankings, past performance. Those are kind of related a little bit. Uh, Morning star factors in the past performance as well as the fees of the account and some opinions on the management as well. So it's nice, it's a nice blended way to look at uh, expected performance. We see the size of the fund being at the very bottom. So that, that tends to be the case, it tends to be the more money you have, the harder it is to move that money around. And so that can lead to actually worse returns. Uh, but I'll give everyone another couple seconds just to get your answers in here. Uh, manager reputation, this is an interesting one. Like if you sell someone a fund and the manager leaves, is it still a good fund? <laughs> or do you, should you follow the guy who's managing it? Who is responsible for the results? Perfect. So I'll touch on, this is a very astute group that we have today, but the most common answer I get when I talk to the lay person is past performance. And so if you look at any fund disclosure, any mutual fund document, any ETF, it's going to have this disclaimer. Past performance is not indicative of future results. And they're not putting this on the statement to throw you off the case and keep the good funds for themselves. Like they put it on statements because it's true. So when you're approaching an investment, you need to have a memory like a goldfish. You, you cannot look at what's happened and use that to interpret what's going to happen moving forward. This is the primary reason for that behavior gap that I mentioned. Investments are the only thing where people rush to buy them when they become more expensive. If a TV doubles in price, you're going to wait to buy it. But as soon as Turkey has 120% returns, humans have this tendency to extrapolate and say, if it did 120 last year, imagine if it did 120 every single year, how rich I would be in the future. Or like this fund outperformed its benchmark by 20%. That guy must be awesome. I have to be with him. Imagine what he's going to do next year. Another way of saying had great performance is saying it's very expensive today because it means the price went up. You're buying something that is very expensive. And so you cannot use past performance to predict future returns, but that is what most lay people do. I wish you could. I wish I could just log into Morningstar, sort by past returns, pick those funds and build a super fund and then move on with my day. But unfortunately it is not that easy. Uh, the group had the answer right. So the best predictor of fund performance within a class is the fees that you pay. So across big companies, medium-sized, small companies, across all bonds, you can see that the cheapest funds, the ones that had the lowest fees, outperform the most expensive. So the red is the low cost funds, the gray is the high cost. It doesn't look super pretty because I stole this from Vanguard, but this is over uh, from 2009 to 2019. We can see that if you just picked funds that cost less, you would have had better performance than if you paid someone more. And I find this is very, this is very counterintuitive for people because if you go to a nice restaurant, you think the hundred dollar steak is going to taste better than the 50. If you are buying a house, you think the $2 million house is going to be in a better neighborhood, nicer amenities than the 500,000. Across the board, when we're trying to proxy for what quality is, we typically use price. If you're searching online and you want to find a store's best item, you search price high to low. However, when it comes to investing, it's not the more you pay, the more you get, it's the less you pay the more you keep. And so this, oftentimes this can be a hurdle for people when I'm first meeting with them. But if I explain sort of the math behind evaluating what a fund 
how to, how to evaluate if a fund is good, it, it very often helps. So if you're looking at a fund and let's say it did 10% uh, in 2020, is, is that a good fund? Let's say it's a Canadian fund that did 10%. You would want to you want to say, well, how did everyone else do, right? Because if the if the Canadian market went up thirty percent and you're funded ten, you'd be ticked. You'd be like, what's this guy doing? He's stinking it up. If the Canadian market went down twenty percent and you got ten, you'd be ecstatic. You'd be so happy. And so that highlights the need to have a benchmark for comparison. And the most common benchmark that we use is the average of all the stocks in the area that fund is focused. So again, keeping it simple, if you took the average of all the stocks added together in Canada, that's a great benchmark for a Canadian fund manager. It's possible to do better than the benchmark, but in order to get more money out of the system than what the stock market did itself, I need to take money out of a different person's pocket. I need to buy a stock before it goes up or I need to sell a stock before it goes down. That means there's someone on the other side of that trade who sold it to me before it went up or bought it for me before it went down. So I beat that person. I took money from them and I moved it to my fund. And so investing in order to beat a benchmark, in order to beat what the average does over time, it ends up being what's called a zero sum game, where if I'm extracting value from the system, someone else is giving it up. And what's interesting is that me and another fund manager, we're not doing this work for free. We're charging fees on top of what we're doing to try to beat the benchmark. And so as soon as I take the system and I start pulling fees out of it, it shifts everyone to the left. It makes everyone a little bit worse off because if one market has these returns, this market is giving money to the institutions that are managing funds. It shifts everything to the left. And so we'll find that some managers will still beat the benchmark, but it's a very small amount because they need to beat other managers and they also need to outperform the fees that they're charging to beat other managers. And so I'm not saying that fund managers are idiots. What I'm saying is that they're all really talented and really good, but they're competing against other really talented and really good managers who are charging high fees. And so it's not just a nice chart that I'll show you, um, but we see this in the data as well. If we compare someone who's managing a Canadian fund, US international to the average of just if you bought and held the entire haystack and didn't pay anyone to do any sort of strategy, you can see 100% of fund managers are going to say, I can beat the benchmark. That's my job. Over one year, less than half can. If we push those numbers out to uh, three, five, or 10 years, you can see the results are abysmal. I highlight that uh, in the US, less than 2% are able to do it. And so very often the argument against buying just the benchmark is you don't want to be average. Average is the worst. You're going to pay someone to do better. But if you were average in this case, if you just had the average with no fees, you would have been better off than 98% of investors who paid somebody. So you get average performance but relative to everybody else. You're actually getting uh, extra performance on top of it. And here, there's, there's a great uh, question in the chat too. What percentage is luck in a fund manager's performance? I don't have hard numbers for you, but a metaphor I use often is if LeBron James is playing basketball against LeBron James, they're both awesome. Like they're so good at basketball. Let's act, let's act like this is uh, 2018. They're both so good at basketball. Whoever wins is going to come down to luck. It's the same thing with fund managers. I'm not saying that they're idiots. I'm saying there's a tower of PhDs at JP Morgan and there's a tower of PhDs at Morgan Stanley. And they're both doing research on stocks, trying to find outpriced securities. And so they're going to get something right once in a while, but it's going to be a small amount and it's mostly going to be due to chance. And so yes, 2% did outperform, but we find that it's, it has no predictive power on if they're going to continue to outperform moving forward. And, and, and if this, uh, all this data dump didn't help so much, uh, Matt has a great way of explaining why it's so hard to beat these benchmarks. Yeah, so you, you might have seen this, uh, I don't know, somewhere, uh, maybe a networking event, or we did this recently at a golf tournament. Uh, where you have to guess the amount of jelly beans in a jar. And if you have the closest get, then you win a prize. And, uh, you know, maybe you spend a lot of time on this and you count uh, the top level of jelly beans. You're counting the rows. Uh, this isn't your first time guessing the amount of jelly beans in a jar. You've done this before. And you might have a really good, uh, you know, might have a really good guess. Uh, we saw that guess, guesses ranged from the low hundreds 
uh, to the high thousands. Uh, but the average actually ended up being really close to the actual number. Uh, and it usually does. Um, and that's kind of like uh, the stock market in a way. Uh, you've got these really talented teams of people that you know aren't going to you know sit on their butt and collect fees. They're going to try to find these mispriced securities. And they're going to trade um, billions of dollars every day buying and selling uh, as their research seems fit. Uh, if they think something is slightly underpriced, they'll buy it. If they think something is slightly overpriced, they'll sell it. And this is kind of like a big voting system, right? Where um, you've got, well, literally billions of dollars every day uh, placing votes on which securities are mispriced and which ones aren't. And uh, you know that's similar to similar to the jelly bean example. Uh, you've got like a power of the crowds thing where you can't probably end up really close to fair market value. And uh, you know instead of paying a manager to do this, uh, you can instead uh, use the power of the crowds to your advantage and not pay all these fees. And what we're talking about here, when we say that, when you could just use the power of the crowds and focus on keeping your fees low is a strategy called indexing. Uh, indexing is when uh, you, uh, like Jordan, for example, talked about the S&P 500 index. Uh, you just stick to indexes globally. Uh, you hold a little bit of everything. You buy the whole hay haystack. So you know that you, know, you have the needle somewhere in the haystack. You have exposure to everything. Uh, you don't try to trade or time the markets. Um, and you just, again, focus on keeping your costs low because the returns come from the markets over time. The markets have outperformed inflation. Um, and the managers, as we've seen, uh, generally do not end up beating the index. So if you think of like, if you think of your portfolio as gas for your retirement, for your retirement, uh, for this example, we're going to like ignore premium gas. We're going to stick to 89 unleaded. Uh, you're driving a Toyota Corolla, a Honda Civic, and you're at an intersection. You need to fill up with gas. You've got gas at one station at $1.50, gas at another station for some reason at $1.45. Um, you don't care where the gas came from. You don't really care how nice the gas station looks, maybe. Um, you're just going to go fill up at $1.45. It's the cheaper way to fill up your car. Uh, the same idea here would be that when you're looking to gain exposure to all these markets, uh, it's kind of like gas. You could just focus on keeping the costs low. Um, more expensive gas, say, or yeah, more expensive gas would just kind of be like the pretty lights on the gas station, uh, which don't actually add up to much. Um, and the, the crazy thing is indexing is nothing new. It's been around since the 1960s, um, 1964 to be exact. And you know, so why are we still talking about this? I, I guess there's a lot of money to be made by uh, selling you these sophisticated investment strategies uh, to yeah, say that they can provide excess returns. Uh, there's a lot of money in it, but that's the thing. It's the the data doesn't show over time that it's been successful. So stick to the gap that you're getting for a dollar forty five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, returns come from the market, not from the managers. And so you just want the cheapest direct co connection to the market. You want the cheapest gas possible. So just find the ratio of stocks to bonds that works for you and then save as much fees as you can by accessing it. Uh, and so then we're going to dive into a couple of questions that we very often get asked around this presentation. Um, while I'm going through this, I have both a link and a QR code to go and you'll, there'll be three they're all optional, they're all anonymous, but three questions to give us feedback on the content that we've covered today. And then we have time set aside to cover these questions we're going through and open Q&A from the group. So as we're going through these questions, uh, feel free to open in a side window, the feedback form and let us know, let us know what you thought. Um, let us know what we could expand on next time, what you wanna hear about next time. And this is also a great way for us to meet people that we can potentially help out. So if you wanna get in touch with us, uh, there's a way you can put your information in as well. Uh, but one of the biggest questions that I get personally when I talk about index investing is on the jargon that we have in the industry. People will say things like, I heard mutual funds are terrible. ETFs are great. I'm an ETF investor. Therefore, I am an index investor. And these terms get very conflated together. So it's good to clarify that index investing is a very low cost way to invest. It's a strategy, but it's not necessarily the same thing as an ETF or a mutual fund. Those are basically accounting structures to create a fund. 
an ETF, you're basically trading tokens that represent the value of a market with somebody else. It takes a bit more administration. You pay some trading costs, but because you're trading tokens and not actually buying and selling the stocks, they end up being cheaper to hold long-term. A mutual fund, you're going to be buying and selling units from a company that buys the stocks for you. So it's easier because they'll do the accounting for you. Uh, they'll be able to sell you half a unit. You don't have to wait until you have enough money to buy a single unit. But it also tends to cost a little bit more because you're paying a premium for that service, for that administration. So if you have an identical mutual fund and ETF, they hold the exact same underlying stocks. The ETF is going to be a little bit cheaper, but it's going to be a little bit more work. The mutual fund is going to be a bit more convenient, but overall your fees are going to be slightly higher. But there's such thing as an active expensive ETF, and there's such thing as a low-cost index mutual fund. So if I had the choice between the two, I would probably take the low-cost mutual fund, even with the higher administration costs, then pay a fund manager to try to outguess the markets and save money because I'm using a token and not a, uh, a company share. And so the biggest question is on that jargon. I wanted to clarify that. And then Matt can help a bit on actually, we say keep your fees low, but how do we actually isolate what are the fees that we're paying? Yeah, which is a fair question because we spent a fair amount of time today talking about fees. So how do you know what you're paying? Um, so what is a management expense ratio? Uh, management expense ratio is exactly that. It's the fee that you are paying uh, the fund provider or the ETF provider um, to uh, maintain their operations, to pay their staff, to pay taxes, to remain compliant. Uh, it's what you're paying to have the fund managed. Uh, these are the fees that you're paying. Uh, and the MER, or the management expense ratio, will be expressed as a percentage on whatever fund document that you're looking at. It could range from, you know, 0.5% to say, you know, upwards of 3%. So that's what you would be looking to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. And very often people will say, oh, it's only 1% per year. Uh, but if you have a million dollars, that's 10 grand a year to underperform over a long periods of time. So very often it's quoted in percentages. I find if you're evaluating, it's good to turn into dollar terms and actually feel like, hey, if I was putting a thousand bucks a month out of my checking account, how would I feel about this? Helps to reframe it in that way. Uh, the last common question we get is, hey, you guys are, seem like investment guys. Why do you still have a job if investing has been solved? Why do you still have a job if everyone should just be doing low cost? Primarily, everyone should be doing low cost index investing. And we love that question because it highlights that Matt and I, we don't control the markets. We don't have secret sauce to get you better returns. Our job isn't to give you better gas. It's to find you the right gas station, plug in, that you're good to go there, and then focus on everything else that we can control. So when people say like, why do you have a job? Uh, because index funds exist. It's like saying, why hire a personal chef? Because chicken breast exists. So we get, well, chicken's the ingredient that goes into it. But what we do is we make a plan uh, one super common one we get is, hey, I get paid in company stock. So whether I like it or not, I'm getting a bunch of company stock added to my account every single year. Should I still be just an index investor or should I somehow build around that to make sure I'm not overexposed because of this weird thing? Or I have multiple companies and a blended family and I hate paying the amount of tax that I do. How do you take care of it for me? Here's everything. So what Matt and I do is we focus on planning, implementation, and ongoing management. We don't control the markets. We don't have any sort of special sauce on the investment side. Besides the fact we're going to recommend you don't pay someone to try to outperform the markets over time. So on the investment side, our jobs are pretty boring, but we like it that way because there's so much academic evidence backing us up. We don't have to rely on seeing the future, making predictions, that kind of thing. Uh, that's all the pre-submitted questions that we had, but we're happy to dive into. Yeah, here we go. We have a pre-submitted question already. Uh, Matt, do you want to take that one? Yeah, there absolutely are. So there are a few providers, um, such as say, I don't know, there's Vanguard, there's iShares. There are providers out there that, where you can buy uh, in Canada, low cost mutual funds or low cost ETFs that track the US stock market. Um, even better, there's some that keep their fees low, but give you global exposure. So you'll have a bit of Canada, a bit of the US, a bit of the developed market and a bit of the emerging market all in one. So you, you're, you end up with exposure over 10,000 different companies and Canadian companies do offer that for sure. They're out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. You could even mix bonds in. So like, yeah, let's say bonds. that you're, let's say you're retired and you want to be 60, 40, and you don't want to be trading. You can buy a ETF or, 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 or fund.
or mutual fund, but low cost fund that is 60, 40. And it always goes back to 60, 40 all the time. So you just sit on it. You don't need to trade. You don't need to worry. It just does it all in the background and you focus on enjoying retirement. Most people don't like looking at spreadsheets and tracking rebalancing and taxes. And that's typically our recommendation there. Yeah, we have another 13 minutes together. Happy to answer other questions people have about investing. I might have to put our disclosures up. Yeah, there we go. Put those up. Great. Just to stay compliant. One note on the... Uh, Actually, no, I won't get into form of holding taxes there. Okay. We had a good question yeah. in the chat as well about uh, does this fee impact also affect private investments? So everything we've been talking about today has been public markets. Mm -hmm. And in order to be listed publicly, in order for a guy like Matt or I just go buy a stock on an exchange and not have to do any sort of extra paperwork, the company needs to disclose its financials all the time. So as like full transparency, here's what's going on. Every quarter, they need to tell people what's happening. And so because they're giving that information away, it means there's not any real hidden secrets. So it means that those prices are probably pretty close to accurate. On the private side, the argument is, hey, these companies aren't reporting earnings. They aren't telling us what's going on underneath the hood. So there must be hidden gems there. It must be a lot easier for me to do some research and beat everybody else and buy this investment to see if it makes money. But what we found is that Private investments tend to charge higher fees. And so even if there is outperformance, any outperformance goes into the fund manager's pocket and not to the end investor. There's very few ways in which you can try to get more money for yourself besides just reducing what you pay to other people. I also wanted to note that uh, Matt and I, we put big blocks in our calendar. And so anyone who attends the session can feel free to use a Calendly link and uh, book a call with us. We'll do 30 minutes to chat about what you're looking for. Um, it might be a fit to work with our team. Or worst case, we'll point you in the right direction. We're happy to leave you with a good experience if there's not a lot we can do to help you uh, on your financial plan. Look through for other questions here. Here's a question. So for a mutual fund, what performance indicators can I check to tell me which one is better than the other? That, that's a great question. That's, that's really, really good. So we don't know what's going to do well moving forward. We have no idea. I don't know if large growth is going to do better than small value. I don't know if China is going to do better than India. All I know is that on average, everything tends to move up and I want to have access to that block that is moving up. And so I'm trying to buy a little bit of everything and I don't want to pay other people to do it. So when you're looking at investing, the first thing you want to prioritize is that you're diversified. You're not just US, you're not just electric vehicles it's broadly spread out. You can do this by buying multiple funds yourself, or you can do this by purchasing a single all-in-one portfolio. So now you know that you have everything. You don't know what's gonna do well. The only way you can know that you're gonna improve your results is by not paying other people, not letting other people take money out of your account. And so when you're comparing investments, diversification first needs to match your risk tolerance. So if you're retired, you might have a bit more bonds and then minimize the fees as much as possible. And so when you're looking for indicators, you ignore past performance. You act like it doesn't exist. Make sure that you're spread out and then minimize the fees at that point. Uh, I see a question here. Would you invest across your whole portfolio at the risk level one determines? So I think that means would I hold the same portfolio in all accounts? I'm going to take it that way. And, and the short answer is yes. So there, there is an argument that you can have better returns by holding like taxable things in one place, non-taxable in another. Uh, we find that the benefits to that are, they exist, but they're marginal. And anytime you give yourself a chance to shoot yourself in the foot through like trading, rebalancing, trying to figure these things out, adding spreadsheets, more often than not, it leads to that behavior gap happening where you get worse returns than the investments you're using because you're fiddling around in it. So for very, very large accounts, where it's being delegated to professional, we might be 60, 40 overall, but hold things strategically in different accounts. But for the majority of people, the majority of people, we say hold the same investment across all accounts, as long as you have a cash buffer for short-term needs. Hmm. Uh, Matt, do you see either of these questions that you like? Uh, what is P double secret sauce compared to the S&P 500 index? Why should a person move 
from S and P 500 or SPY yet to PWL? Uh, yeah, which is a fair question. So we have no secret sauce. You know, we're not trying to outperform the S and P 500 or the global stock market. Um, really, what we're doing is everything out after the investment portion has been solved. So it's it's really going to be okay. Well, do you know how much you actually need to retire? Do you uh, want to not look at your accounts and let us handle all of that? Uh, do you have a complicated situation where you're wondering, uh, you know, how to uh, divest or move away from your business? Um, how you withdraw um, efficiently from a corporation? Uh, is it time for you know a family trust? I, it's I, I'm going on and on here, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that I'm with you, Dmitri. Like that part's we're, we're good there. We're not going to try to. There is no secret thought that we're offering. We are moving past that now. How are we planning to make the most of your time and your priorities, and how could we, how could we help make your life easier at that point? Now that we know that the investing is solved. Perfect. And I see uh, Dan's question. I, I have an RRSP matching program where the fees are high. Is this common? And so first, you, wouldn't, you, would, you should always maximize the matching because even if you're paying 2%, they're doubling your money on the way in. So it's going to take a lot of fees to erode that matching that you get from using your group plan. Most group RRSPs that I see will let you do one transfer out per year, at least one transfer out per year uh, with low or minimal fees. So what we do for most uh, people that we work with is they'll maximize their group plan. And then every kind of like Christmas time, we'll kind of have it on a regular calendar. We'll transfer it over and move it to low cost index funds. While it's there, um, we'll say like, hey, let's find the lowest cost diversified option that we can. What's the closest thing that would be optimal? Let's hold that. And then as often as we can without being completely administratively insane, let's transfer it over and move it to what is actually optimal long-term. I find also typically group plans will sometimes they'll have lower fees than if you were to go to the marketplace and buy them yourself. So 2% is quite high. Um, I have seen it where it's 2% out in the marketplace, but 0.6 for employees. But our, our general advice is to maximize it to get the matching. And then as, as much as is administratively realistic, uh, transfer over uh, to, to a place that's cheaper. You could, you could even do self-directed. If, if you're comfortable with that kind of thing. Perfect. I can see Angelica put my link in the chat. So if you guys want to book a call with me, feel free. Hop on Zoom together. Any other questions from the group? I'll give it another minute here. Will this webinar be recorded? So in our industry, there's lots of compliance. It's going to get compliance sign off, and then we will send it out to attendees and people who didn't make it. Good question. Okay, if there's no more questions, feel free to let me know. Oh, here's one. A couple. We have two. You want to take uh, first one, Matt? Do you foresee changes to ETF structures for fractional shares and even lower transactional costs? Um, that is where we've seen things heading, heading in Canada. In the States, it's fairly common. You've got zero commission trading platforms. Um, fractional shares have been around for a while. Now there's platforms in Canada that are doing the same. And we are seeing transactional costs going down, which is a good thing for everyone. Um, it's probably going to keep trending that way. I think that answers, hopefully that answers your question. Anything to add, Jordan? No, uh, it just the, there's pressure on fees. So the information we talked about today is becoming more wide, widely known. We can take some credit for that with sessions like this. <laughs> um, but yeah, if people start to know they're not paying for anything, then uh, they're not going to pay it. They're going to, and then funds and companies have to compete. They become just gasoline. They have to compete on price at that point. Uh, we have a great question from Matthew in the chat. If you get stocks in your company, is it generally a good idea to sell? Uh, this is to increase diversification. And so I have a good story about this. I have a buddy who works at what's called a real estate investment trust. It is a financial company that invests primarily in real estate. And it's typically viewed as a very safe investment. But I was talking to him and I was saying, it's a safe investment for me because I don't work there. But for you, the chances that it goes down at the same time you lose your job is super high. 
So for you, it's an ultra risky investment, but the price of it is going to be like it's for everybody else. So when you receive that, you're paying a ton for a really risky investment that doesn't match you as a person. And so we find that even though you want to like share in the success of the business with your coworkers, rationally, it's a terrible idea to own stock where you work because the, what's called the correlation, the relationship between your income and that stock is really, really high. The stock could drop at the exact same time that you lose your job and you're getting, yeah, you're getting ruined from both sides. Another way to look at it is if your employer gave you all cash, how much of that cash would you put towards company stock? If you were going to do 10%, if you feel like that's great because it's all cash, then you can keep 10%. But there's this concept called the endowment effect, where if you already own something, you tend to value it more than if you didn't own it. They did a study where they had people selling a mug and someone buying it and the price never lined up because people just irrationally value the thing in the hand. And so because it feels like they're giving you the stock, the stock could be cash. You could sell it easily, but the fact that it's stock already creates this bias where we overvalue it relative to what it is. So I always say to people, rationally, it's a terrible idea. Like the the risk for you in that company is way higher than the average person. Second, imagine that you didn't receive the stock already. You would uh, instead receive cash. How much of that money would you put towards stock? Or would you buy index funds instead? Or would you pay down debt? Or would you go on vacation with your family? Treat it like it's cash. Decide how much you put towards it and then figure out um, if it makes sense to sell it as it matures, as it vests. Uh, yes, there will be a recording. It will be sent out. We're going to email that out after the fact. And if you didn't get a chance to do the feedback survey as well, uh, we're going to email that out as well. So feel free to uh, give us more detailed feedback when you're not on the presentation. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate everyone coming. I hope this was valuable. Uh, we're, we're planning to do things like this every couple of weeks. We'll be sending out notifications for them. I believe the next one is less on investments and more on financial planning. So when the next one comes out, feel free to attend. It'll be different content, different presenters, a different vibe overall. Uh, If there's no more questions, I really appreciate everyone coming and we are going to sign off. Thanks everybody.